Welcome to Abraham Out of One Many, an engaging art exhibition brought to you by Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston and curated by Caravan, an international arts NGO nonprofit that is recognized as a leader in using the arts to further our global quest for a more harmonious future, both with each other and with the earth. Interfaith Ministries is Houston's oldest service organization. Dialogue, collaboration, and service have been at the heart of our work for over 50 years. Our programs fall into four areas. We are Texas's largest Meals on Wheels program covering six counties, but primarily in Harris and Galveston counties. We're one of the top 10 largest Meals on Wheels programs in the country. We also have a strong Refugee Services Resettlement Program working with Episcopal Migration Ministries to help resettle refugees into the Houston area. Volunteer Houston connects individuals, groups, and companies with nonprofit agencies to transform the greater Houston community for good through volunteerism. And interfaith relations and community partnerships fosters understanding, respect, and engagement among people of all faiths. IRCP is thrilled to be able to host this exhibit. Please visit www.imgh.org to learn more about us. Between April 20th and May 21st, we hosted Abraham out of one many, virtual exhibit of 15 paintings by three celebrated artists from the Middle East. We had planned to host these paintings in person in our Brigitte and Bashar Kalai Plaza of Respect and Great Hall in April of 2020, but COVID derailed those plans. We were thrilled to work with Caravan to create a virtual gallery experience so that we were able to reschedule the exhibit. A virtual experience allowed for a wide variety of accessible programs, including the program you're about to enjoy. We are grateful to the sponsors that made this event possible, especially our lead donors, Joni and David Andrews, Debbie and Floyd Kearns, Marion and Paul Cones, and Carol and Frank Gruen. This exhibit came to us through the incredible work of Caravan. Its mission is based on the belief that the arts can be one of the most effective mediums to heal our world and to creatively foster peace, harmony, wholeness, and health in all its forms. Caravan originated out of an artistic bridge building initiative in Cairo, Egypt in 2009 that focused on addressing the then growing chasm of discord and misunderstanding between the peoples, cultures, and creeds of the Middle East and the West. The nomadic caravan theme comes out of the founding vision to encourage and facilitate those from diverse backgrounds and worldviews to journey together through the arts. While Caravan's mission is global in focus, they maintain an ongoing program emphasis on the Middle East due to their founding. We invite you to visit oncaravan.org to learn more about the organization. Let's now turn to our opening event hosted by Empower, a program of Interfaith Ministries, Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships Department, and unites a diverse group of women in dialogue and action through community events, coffee chats, service projects, and large events to empower themselves, the next generation, and the community. Let's join now as Jessica Kaiser from our Empower Leadership introduces the event. Really glad to be here, and it's so exciting to see all these faces. I wanna welcome everyone to the opening program for the Abraham Out of One Mini, a beautiful, stirring, inspirational exhibit that features artwork from three talented artists about living harmoniously in today's world. We're in for a treat as we hear from our speaker, the Right Reverend Paul Gordon Chandler, uh, somewhere in these pictures, uh, about the exhibit, the artists, and what motivated them to create this exhibit uh, depicting harmony, peace, and welcoming the stranger. My name is Jessica Kaiser, as Jody's already said, and I'm pleased to be one of the exhibit sponsors and to chair the evening, which is being hosted by Empower, which is Interfaith Ministries Women Initiative and uh, a group that we've been uh, really, I've been really pleased to be part of. The exhibit and this reception were supposed to take place last year in the Great Hall against the backdrop of the Brigitte and Bashar Kalai Plaza of Respect at Interfaith Ministries, but as we know, COVID changed all of that. But thankfully, Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler and his team at Caravan created this virtual experience of Abraham out of one mini instead. Caravan is an international arts nonprofit founded by Bishop Chandler and is recognized as a leader in using the arts to heal our world and creatively foster peace, harmony, and wholeness. Today, we are the first to launch Abraham exhibit virtually. 
And indeed, we're actually the only one in the state of Texas to host. The idea of living harmoniously in, Texas, in today's world, of welcoming the stranger, of bringing people together in dialogue are core to both caravan and interfaith ministries. So we're delighted to welcome you tonight to hear from the exhibit's curator, learn more about the educational and interactive programs that we have planned during our time with Abraham from today, April 20th, all the way until May 21st, and then experience the exhibit as part of a docent-led tour by Reverend Greg Hahn. Interfaith Ministries has been able to bring this exhibit to Houston and plan amazing programs around the exhibit because of our sponsors, including our lead sponsors, Joni and David Andrews, Marion and Paul Kearns, Debbie and Floyd Kearns, Frank and Carol Bruhn, and many others here tonight. All sponsors are recognized on the website. We dedicate tonight to our sponsors who through their support of the exhibit are supporting Interfaith Ministries. I'm especially grateful to Empower for hosting tonight. Your community events, coffee chats and service projects. We support Interfaith Ministries mission to help feed nearly 5,000 homebound seniors and their pets daily, resettle refugees, promote interfaith dialogue and engage people in volunteerism. Now I'd like to welcome Jay Harper. Thank you so much, Jessica, for your warm and gracious welcoming remarks. Do I get to be spotlighted now, Greg? Hello? I'm still looking at Jessica. Here we go. Uh, again, thank you, Jessica. We really appreciate your, your warm remarks. Hello, everyone. I'm Jay Harper. I'm the uh, board chair of Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. And uh, as Jessica said, during April and May, this exhibit will unite people uh, in learning, dialogue, and experiences through programs uh, planned by our amazing Jody Bernstein and her exceptional interfaith. I knew I'd get her. Uh, and her exceptional interfaith relations and community partnerships team. Uh, among the upcoming programs, Faith in Our City sessions on Zoroastrian and Islamic traditions a dinner dialogue, our third annual Gershenson lecture, and a special one-time only program with the three artists from their homes all over the world. Make sure you don't miss that one. Docents will lead school groups through the virtual viewings of the exhibit. And uh, we've set aside some dates for our community uh, to view the exhibit as well. The calendar of events is uh, on our website and we'll also email the uh, calendar to you. Please attend as many of the Abraham programs as you can, not just tonight's opening. The exhibit is the brainchild, as Jessica said, of the Right Reverend Paul Gordon Chandler, who is the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Wyoming, which is quite a stretch when you hear the rest of this. Uh, Bishop Chandler grew up in Senegal, West Africa. So to get from there to Wyoming is another story probably for another evening. And he's lived around the world in senior leadership roles with faith-based publishing, the arts, ecumenical relief and development, and the Episcopal Church. An authority on the Middle East and Africa, he is the founding president of Caravan, and his full bio is long and very impressive. I encourage you to look at it later. Since our paths crossed with Bishop Chandler, we have come to know his passion for peace building, interfaith dialogue, and human kindness, and we would add one more title, friend. On behalf of Martin Kaminsky, President and CEO of Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston, Jody Bernstein, Vice President for Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships, our entire board, and Empower, let me welcome our friend, a global peacemaker, and our speaker for tonight, Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler. There we go. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't on mute anymore. There we go. All right. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, thank you so much for that gracious uh, introduction. Uh, on behalf of Caravan, I want to thank all of you for attending this special evening uh, of Abraham out of one mini. Uh, it's an artistic initiative, as you'll learn here in a minute. Uh, and it's been a real privilege to work with Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. We've been through the ups and downs through all of this, of course, initially thinking it would be a physical in-person 
exhibition. And, uh, and then of course, now we are, have launched, this is our first uh, actually opportunity to launch this exhibition in a virtual way. So warm welcome to all of you and thank you for warming, uh, warmly welcoming me, uh, me as well. Now, I grew up in Senegal, West Africa, a Muslim majority country. I spent the first 18, almost 19 years of my life there. And whenever you need wisdom or counsel, the tradition is to go to an elder, usually someone with gray hair or white hair. In other words, someone with life experience. And in that regard, when you ask for counsel or wisdom, they always respond with a proverb or a parable instead of giving you a direct answer. And one of the proverbs I grew up around in West Africa in the language of Wolof, which is the West African tribal language there in Senegal, goes like this. So I may had it to go low, sat ngemba dutak muk. And it means this. If you have a monkey for your friend, you'll never get your loincloth stuck in a tree. Now, meaning it's who you know at critical moments in time that makes all the difference. And there's no question that that's very much what is behind this exhibition on Abraham. I think you would likely all agree that today's climate of increasing prejudice and stereotyping in the West has resulted in what some are calling actually a new tribalism, which often leads to a dehumanizing of the other, whether in worldviews or words or actions. The issue has become all the more important now as it's entered the political discourse on both sides of the Atlantic here in the United States and of course in Europe as well. And it's vital that the, this intensification of misunderstanding and misrepresentation not become the new norm. The Abraham Out of One Mini exhibition is really an artistic response to today's climate of increasing prejudice and stereotyping and discrimination, whether related to color or faith or ethnicity or a variety of diversities and different backgrounds. And like never before, we believe all this needs to be counteracted by creative initiatives that are based on our similarities and what we all hold in common. And more than ever, I think it's essential that creative demonstrations of dialogue be developed. And that's what we're doing here this evening. It's in this context that this timely contemporary art exhibition opening here this evening titled Abraham Out of One Mini is an artistic response more specifically to the recent rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim sentiment in the West, reminding us that Muslims, Christians, and Jews all have the same family heritage through our ancestor Abraham. Abraham has certainly been a figure that has captured the imaginations of artists over the centuries, from Caravaggio to Rembrandt to William Blake to James Tissot to Marc Chagall in the last century, and of course of writers untold from Philo to Milton to William Faulkner, for that matter. And more importantly, Abraham, or Ibrahim in Arabic, or Avraham in Hebrew, is the most jointly beloved spiritual figure by all the monotheistic faiths, Christians, Muslims, Druze, uh, Jews, Baha'i, and then of course a number of other smaller minorities that exist within the Middle East, the Abrahamic faiths, who all see themselves as proud descendants of one whom today we would say is a Southern Iraqi. Abraham is without doubt one of the most unifying figures in the midst of today's discord and strife. He's often referred to as the father of us all, as are Sarah and Hagar, our mothers. And in each of these three faith traditions, whose followers are all referred to as children of Abraham, the figure of Abraham is seen as a model specifically of welcoming the stranger and embracing the other. And in this sense, he's a guide for all of us, regardless of what cultural, religious, or non-religious or ethnic background we come from. This timely exhibition's title, Abraham Out of One Many, plays off of that well-known Latin motto, which is, of course, on the U.S. presidential seal, E Pluribus Unum, Out of Many, One. 
And it focuses in on what we can all learn from Abraham's story about living together more harmoniously. And for this exhibition, as each of these Abrahamic faiths originated from the Middle East, three celebrated Middle Eastern contemporary visual artists from the faith traditions of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism were commissioned to produce five paintings each that interpret Abraham's life for us today, serving as a guide toward creating cultures of peace and harmony and justice, which of course is very apropos right now with all that's going on in our country, and healing, of course, which is all the more needed as we look to the future, and doing so all as descendants of a shared heritage. The three artists are Sinan Hussein, an Iraqi artist living in Baghdad, who's from a Muslim background. He comes from the Shia Muslim tradition. Shai Azuleh, a contemporary Jewish artist from Israel. He comes from the Orthodox tradition in his own faith. And Kays al-Sindi, who's an Iraqi artist as well, of the ancient Chaldean Assyrian Christian tradition that come from what were called the, the Nestorians, the ancient Nestorian church in the Middle East. All three are, are award-winning artists and highly regarded in international art circles. They've sold at Christie's and Sotheby's. And the question is really this, that this exhibition attempts to answer. What can Abraham teach us all today toward freeing our world from any sectarian strife? The exhibition highlights five themes related to Abraham's life that have profound implications for how we can live together harmoniously, together as one family, descendants of a shared heritage. The five themes are living as a pilgrim, which, are, which is actually a theme, of course, in all three traditions and exemplifies Abraham's worldview and mindset, let alone his own geographical journey throughout his life. And by that, living as a pilgrim, we really mean it's a, it's a mindset of continuing to journey, not having arrived. So much of our various creeds and that creedal emphasis of our faith gives the sense of having arrived. And yet I think it's much more accurate for all of us to see ourselves as pilgrims. We're journeying. And when one sees themselves that way, they're much more willing to ask others for directions on how and help and how to get there, to meet new people, even asking those from another tradition for assistance in living our faith tradition most uh, faithfully. So living as a pilgrim. Second, welcoming the stranger. And my, does, him, uh, does Abraham embody this? Sacrificial love, compassion, the compassionate one is how he's often referred to. And then friend of God. And by friend of God here, we mean that when you're a friend of God, you're a friend of everything that God loves. All humanity and all of creation, the environment, etc., and I would encourage you to read through specifically the artist statements as you go through the exhibition that bring uh, very much each of their paintings related to these specific themes to life. And also to read about the artist uh, because it gives some real context uh, to the work that you will be seeing. The exhibition premiered its 24 month global tour, tour in Rome at the historic Episcopal Church there of St. Paul's Within the Walls. The Pontifical Council for Interfaith Dialogue from the Vatican was part of the initial launch, as was the World uh, Muslim League, as were a number of key rabbis from the various traditions within Judaism. It was then showcased in Paris, France at the American Keith Cathedral. This is in 2019. And then for the month of August uh, that month, that year, it went to Edinburgh, Scotland and was part of the Festival Fringe, which is actually the largest art festival in the world. And it's now actually on tour throughout the United States. It opened in Omaha at the Three Faith uh, Initiative there, and then went to Boston on Boston Common, and then Jacksonville, Florida, now, of course, virtually in Houston. And then, of course, it uh, is still taking its in-person tour as now COVID is subsiding in many parts of, the, of our country. And so it's physically in Wyoming, 
and it will be here in Wyoming for another month and a half, and then it goes to Hartford, Connecticut at Hartford Seminary there. Uh, and, and Houston, of course, is just being showcased virtually, but it's actually very, very uh, cutting edge for us because it's the first time that we've done something like this. And so we're thrilled uh, that it's happening there with you. As this important exhibition travels, it takes with it the fundamental message of intercultural and interreligious harmony, seeking really to serve as this, con this common starting point on which to build a society that inherently respects and honors cultural and religious diversity, where all live and work together harmoniously to jointly enhance their communities. And throughout the tour, the art really is a catalyst for the development of an exciting schedule of program and events. Of course, you're going to have a number of them there virtually in Houston that accompany the exhibition at each venue. They stimulate discussion and dialogue and education, promoting further understanding. And behind all of this is the belief that art is a universal language that has the ability to dissolve the differences that divide us. And we have found that the arts can actually be one of the most effective mediums to enhance understanding, to bring about respect, to enable sharing, certainly to deepen friendship between those of different faiths and cultures. As the dynamic former Tunisian minister of culture, Latifa Lakhtar, says, Creativity is the greatest way to approach our battle against those people who would destroy even the most elementary principles of life. And the vision for Caravan, who actually curated this exhibition and has put it together, Caravan's a peace-building NGO that uses the arts to build sustainable peace around the world using arts in transformational ways. It originated in Cairo, Egypt, in 2009, and actually somewhat quite humorously, because this was, of course, about six years, seven years after a lot of the tension that had surfaced again between the Middle East and West. And I was sitting with, sitting with the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, the intellectual and the spiritual heart of Sunni Islam in, uh, that's based there in Cairo. Of course, the majority of Muslims around the world are Sunni Muslims. And we had another interfaith event and we looked at each other and we saw the same people there that we always see, about 100 people. And he looked at me and he said, what are we going to do? And uh, we actually were both quite bored, to be very honest with you, at the same time, seeing the same people. And I said, well, let's take the church that I was serving in at that time. Let's make it into an art gallery. And we did so, bringing 20 Christian and 20 Muslim artists at that time together and the idea was that we're journeying together through the arts. We're on a caravan. And he opened it for us. We had several thousand people there at the opening. And over the course of about 10 to 12 days, we had 10,000 people attend. And it really took us back. And it allowed us to see how the arts can serve as one of the most effective ways to address all of this. Now, one may ask, why art is so effective? Well, obviously, there's something transcendent about art. It takes one to, into that deeper dimension. However, less obviously, we would say one of the secrets of using the arts in peace building, especially in the intercultural and the interreligious uh, arena, is that it's indirect in its approach to addressing very difficult and challenging issues. It's like doing it under the table. And as a result, those all too often defensive walls that very often do go up, do not. Also, uh, artistic initiatives like this one, they really become encounter points, bringing people together that would normally never come together to gain insights into the other and provide greater understanding, as well as to alleviate fears that may exist. And within all of this, we profoundly believe that artists can lead the way. With their embrace of greater tolerance than others, artists are naturally change agents and therefore can provide new pathways of understanding that transcends borders and how we see the other. Certainly, the power of creativity counteracts the demonization of the other. And time and time again, we have seen the words of the 14th century Persian Sufi poet and mystic Hafez to be true. Art is the conversation. Art offers an opening for the heart. 
Art is at least this knowledge of where we are standing. In this wonderland, we are partners straddling the universe. Art helps us put ourselves in the other's shoes. And in this sense, looking through the lens of Abraham's life, this exhibition has the primary objective of helping us see the other with fresh eyes, celebrating the diversity of human expression, and also asserting the common priorities that we all seek and treasure. Our day calls for a whole new kind of movement, not of belief or of religious unity, but quite simply, one that builds on what we hold in common. And I think one of the ways to say, to understand this is, I would say, is we need to build on the dark side of the moon. And for the sake of an illustration, that crescent, that when you see a crescent in the sky, which of course is the Islamic symbol of faith, you can see that crescent, of course, because of the reflection. But whenever you see a crescent, the majority of the moon is dark. And for the sake of an illustration, I would say that little crescent that we can see in the sky is what we have different between us as Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And the dark side of the moon, that large majority part, is what we have in common. And the challenge for us, as never before, I think, is to build our relationships with the other, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, on the dark side of the moon. A la Pink Floyd, if you remember that from years ago. They were prophetic, though they may have not known it in that context. But we're too often blinded by the constant illumination of our differences, that crescent part, that we can't see all that we have in common. As the early 20th century Lebanese poet and artist and mystic Khalil Gibran, who profoundly bridged the creeds and cultures of the East and West, so beautifully said, your neighbor is your other self dwelling behind a wall. In understanding, all walls fall down. And Gibran goes on to say these other insightful words. I love you when you bow in your mosque, kneel in your temple, and pray in your church. For you and I are children of one religion, and it is God's spirit. I close with some thoughts from two artists, thoughts that are very apropos, I believe, at this time. The first is from Leonard Bernstein, the renowned late Jewish composer and conductor, highlighting the transformative power of art. He writes, the point is, art never stopped a war. That was never its function. Art cannot change events but it can change people. It can affect people so that they are changed. And then they act in a way that may affect the course of events by the way they believe and the way they think. And secondly, perhaps no words better resonate really with the spirit of this exhibition that we're going to look at together than the words of that profound Dutch artist, Vincent van Gogh, or Vincent van Gogh, as we say in English. Vincent van Gogh said, the more I think it over, the more I feel that there is nothing more truly artistic than to love people. And I think very much that's what this exhibition, at the end of the day, is all about. Thank you, and it's a real privilege to be with you. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Bishop Chandler, thank you. I think if we were in person, you'd be receiving a standing ovation right now. Um, all of us are grateful for your words of wisdom. They were inspiring. They were informative and definitely worth the wait. Um, I think that we're going to have to find a way when COVID says it's safe for all of us to meet you in person one day by getting you to Houston to speak to us uh, in person. Um, we'll work on that. Um, tonight, we have three of Thank our you. friends. Thank you. Tonight, we have three of our friends from the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faith traditions. Susan Witchin, Rabbi David Lyon, and Tamina Masood, and each has a question they would like to ask of you. And for the rest of our audience tonight, as we're 
participating in this brief uh, Q&A, feel free to write your own questions in the chat box and we'll get to them shortly. Um, Susan, you're up. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Chandler, first, I want to thank you for your wisdom, your foresight, and your ability to bring these artists work together to foster unity in our diverse world. We have been looking forward to this exhibit since last year. So here's my question. As Abraham embodies righteousness, justice, and obedience to God, how do these artists show that by respecting and understanding the similarities in the three religions, we can all live harmoniously into the future per Abraham's example? Thank you. I think uh, some of that question perhaps are it was answered in what I was sharing in many ways. Um, one of the things I would just give you behind the scenes a little bit, because it's wonderful to kind of see a, an exhibition like this. And but uh, behind the scenes, it wasn't easy to put together. Mm -hmm. And the reason is largely that we had uh, artists from both the Christian and Muslim, uh, excuse me, uh, Muslim and Jewish traditions opt out of participating. Mm -hmm. And it was largely because, um, oh, I, I didn't mean, I said Muslim and Jewish, I meant Muslim and Christian. And because they were both Arab and because of the context of the Israeli-Palestinian situation and how prevalent that is, of course, in the Middle East. And so we had a few artists that we were inviting to participate that said yes at first, and then they heard they had some of the pressure from peer pressure and then opted out. Now, so what I say all that to simply uh, give you some context as to these three individuals have not just painted something that exemplifies, I think, how their view of how we can live together harmoniously, but are living it in that way. One in particular, Sanan Hussein, coming uh, from the Shia Muslim background, has lost friends, believe it or not, by participating in this exhibition. And in his view, he basically said, well, then obviously they weren't the kind of friends that are real friends, right, in that regard. Um, and when the, the media and publicity uh, was uh, released about the exhibition in Rome when it was launched, uh, and the World Muslim League did a, a large promotion of it, very, we were very grateful for that, uh, Sanan really uh, was it was very much attacked um, and uh, not physically, but of course, verbally uh, and through social media. Um, the one, the other thing I would say is that they all very much are committed and devout in their own faith traditions. So these are not just nominal, you know, by association. And so that's the other thing I would say is, which is kind of unique, is they all are practicing uh, their faith in its profundity. Thank you so much, Bishop Chandler. Call on Rabbi David Lyon now to ask the second question. Thank you, Reverend Chandler, for being here and for your own vision and creativity, even to prompt such a project. And uh, we're grateful that uh, for those who wait, some good things do come. Um, in Genesis chapter 12 in the Torah, uh, God says to Abraham, go forth uh, and arrive at a place that I will show you. And um, in one commentary, the rabbis ask the question, why didn't God show Abraham the place immediately? Why did Abraham have to wait? And one answer they provided was um, delayed gratification would make the destination more beloved in Abraham's eyes. And so my question to you is, how would you describe for all of us, the children of Abraham, the destination we still need to seek. And though we've been patient along the way, how can creativity hasten our arrival? And since you've addressed some of that already, I want to also ask, what evidence have you seen that you can report that creativity is doing something, changing something for us as we anticipate uh, what we all desire in the world we live in and share? 
It's a great question. It's that latter part, I think, is uh, that's where the real uh, rubber hits the road, and uh, that's where real transformation, of course, comes about, which is our heart in all of this at the end of the day. It's not just to have another art show, but it's to see lives and worldviews uh, changed. Um, the first point, first question, the first aspect of that, I would say, is I'm not sure we're about arrival. We're about the journey. And the journey gets sweeter and sweeter as we get closer and closer together. And the irony in all of that, the paradox, is that in us getting closer together, we also end up closer uh, to where we also desire to go in our own faith traditions. I have personally benefited tremendously uh, from my Muslim brothers and sisters. I spent most of my life as a minority within an Islamic majority context. And uh, so I was even just here last night, for example, giving a talk at a church here in Jackson, Wyoming, and uh, began with uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, you know, as every surah in the Quran begins, uh, in the name of God, the merciful and the compassionate, kind of laying the, the foundation for all of our discussions uh, as we, as we um, began to uh, uh, meet together. Um, in terms of transformational impact, I'll share a story, and there are many stories I could share. One, and uh, this story is uh, uh, one of the more uh, dramatic ones. One of our exhibitions was in Cairo, Egypt, and we had uh, a delegation of imams come. Uh, and part of the exhibition was to begin to highlight the renovation of the synagogues, the historic synagogues uh, there in Egypt. Of course, there are very few Jews left in Egypt um, from in the early 50s under Nasser. Many, they all left because of pressure. Uh, and so there's been a movement to want to honor them again in that tradition there. And so these imams came because they were curious, came all the way from Alexandria to Cairo. They stayed in the art exhibit, uh, which was in the church, a large historic church there, uh, until about 1 a.m. They were the last people out. And as I'm talking to them, I realize that they've never met a Christian priest before. Now, there are 10% of Egypt, maybe 8 to 10% are Christian, Coptic Egyptian Christians. But those to, though the Coptic priests tend to very much stick by themselves. They don't mingle in that way. Um, and so I was talking to this young imam there, very young, dynamic imam, and we decided, let's change this. So we started a program called the Priest Imam Exchange Program, where an imam goes and lives for a weekend with the priest and his family in there in Cairo. They go to all the prayers over the weekend. They eat the meals together, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a little debrief time. And then uh, a weekend or two later, we do the same thing, the reverse. The priest goes. Uh, and spends the weekend at the imam's family, lives with them, has the guest bedroom, goes to the Friday prayers, and et cetera. And then out of that, we, uh, we have a time where we bring them all together. And it's been fascinating to see how they've begun to, uh, in a sense, they become ambassadors for peace, of course, in their own communities, but how they've become friends. And they also realize they actually have the same, so many things in common. They have the same challenges with their teenagers and, you know, and, uh, and, and issues with uh, their partners and spouses and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that we all, uh, you know, in life have to, to process and, and deal with. We've had 400 priests and imams go through that program. And it's been transformational, uh, both for us to see and for them to experience. Thank you so much, Bishop Chandler. We have one more question from Tamina Masood. And then after you answer that, I will turn it over to Greg and he'll start taking some uh, questions from the chat box. So Tamina, my dear friend, please, you're up. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Shukran, shukran. Blessing of uh, Ramadan upon all of you and your loved ones. Bishop Chandler, indeed, this is a pleasure and an honor and I'm very grateful to Interfaith for giving me this opportunity to uh, be here with you. Um, 
it is quite a journey that I see uh, when I go over your, um, your life uh, path from uh, Senegal to Tunisia to uh, UK to Cairo and then now Wyoming. It always feels like you've been in a pilgrimage yourself. And um, uh, I hope that you have been able to uh, experience the themes of Abrahamic uh, uh, lessons during that pilgrimage of yours and you have been able to build the bridges that you so desire to do so, and you leave them strong uh, behind you. Uh, my question uh, today to you would be, uh, from these Abrahamic five themes that you mentioned, uh, living as a pilgrim, uh, welcoming the stranger, uh, you know, having uh, sacrificial love, uh, practicing compassion, and being a friend of God, Khalilullah, which of these themes uh, do you see most visible amongst the three uh, artists that we have here? Uh, number one and number two, do you feel their own traditions have an uh, have a expression into the, that, that piece of art that they present? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, I would just say uh, my, I, I, my journey has been very much one of pilgrimage and continues to be. And I've always been greatly influenced by that uh, Psalm, Psalm 82, or then the Zabur. Uh, and right in the middle of that Psalm, it says, blessed are those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And I believe profoundly in that. Um, and so therefore I'm still journeying. Uh, in terms of the, the art and the themes here, uh, I, uh, there are, for example, one particular painting I would say speaks most loudly and clearly uh, to each of the themes. At least those are my perspectives, and I could share those. Um, but the one thing I would say is, um, and I'll just give you an example, uh, because we just talked about pilgrimage. The one I really am profoundly uh, moved by in its simplicity about living as a pilgrimage is Shai Azule. And if you, and there at, at, uh, in Houston, they've selected one of his paintings uh, as the kind of the branding for this there in Houston. But this is another particular one of his paintings. It's where he's standing on a hill. There's an, uh, just one individual on a hill looking off into the landscape in the distance in the middle of a desert. And of course, I grew up around the desert. I grew up with the Tuaregs. And, you know, in the desert, there's a sense that of complete vulnerability. And I think his work there in that particular theme communicates this very well, that you cannot make your way through the desert alone. You are dependent on everyone that you encounter. And so I, I you know, for Abraham, I think of it as not just leaving a geographic uh, home place, uh, our homeland, going to another foreign place. And of course, he journeyed till the end of his life and only toward the end did he buy a plot of land in order for Sarah uh, to be buried and eventually himself. But I think he journeyed in another way, and that is he left behind kind of this narrow-minded and parochial wor worldview. So it was not so much a change of geography, but really much more profoundly about a journey of, in the geography of the heart. And um, now, in terms of the art, I could go through each one. I know we don't have time to do that because I know Greg is going to lead us through uh, in a, in a, as we go through the exhibition. But I would say the one and the biggest surprise that comes is related to Sanan Hussein's work, which is more fantastical and whimsical and also has images in it uh, of the prophet Ibrahim, Abraham, Abraham. And uh, so most non-Muslims are surprised that he was allowed to do that. And I think one of the things that's important about this exhibition is in, in the course of the themes that they're emphasizing, it's also changing stereotypes that are erroneous of the other. And this is contemporary art. And it's important to remember that Sinan Hussein a Shia Muslim is a, one of his favorite patrons is the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, a Sunni Muslim. So that in itself changes, you know, the stereotypes that often exist. 
Thank you. Thank you. Shukran Shukran. Awi. Bishop Chandler, thank you so very much. I think all of us learned so much in just the brief time that we've had with you already. Um, before I go on, what I'd like to do is just recognize a few people who've been behind the scenes making all of this happen. Um, and these people are my colleagues, um, Brandy Ledette, Greg Hahn, Kim Mabry, Jet Phillips, Sukri Woodley, and Sam Hashemi. They have, um, for a year and a half, two years now, been on this journey to bring Abraham uh, to all of us, um, and now virtually to all of us. And they've been super fun to work with, and I just want to give them a real shout out. These things just don't happen. They happen because of their hard work. And of course, to everyone here tonight, thank you for being with us. Um, I want to also just let you know some exciting news is that we're continuing this, uh, this, this message of harmony and peace and unity through the arts through another Empower event. It's our Unity concert. Um, it's on June 8th. It'll be another virtual experience. You'll hear about it in an upcoming email, but look for that information and um, hopefully you'll join us back for that next artful journey, um, focusing on peace and harmony and um, empowerment. I'm gonna turn it back over to Greg and uh, Greg, you're up. Bishop Chandler, um, thank you so much for those comments. Um, my two favorite Arabic words that you mentioned, one shukran, thank you, and the other one is mumtaz. So mumtaz, excellent. Um, I want to, um, I have a question, but I want to bracket that one to uh, honor the question from the chat box from Fatima Ali, who is a, a dear friend of Interfaith Ministries, one of our bright stars. Um, she is a recent college graduate, but when she was in high school, she was part of our Interfaith Youth Leadership Program called iLead. And she asks, um, where is it? Do you have any advice for those aspiring to foster interfaith community and understanding through art, creativity, and dialogue? So very broad question. So maybe thinking about kind of your best practices based on your experience that you'd like to highlight about your kind of best advice that you give. And maybe mm -hmm. not a problem. We don't have time for a proverb, sadly. <laughs> yes. No, I would just say uh, I, I would really address in a local context felt needs and uh, and look at it creatively and not just and think of the arts in a broad sense, music and literature and film and drama and, you know, all of the creatives and kind of look at it in those ways where you come at that theme of our commonalities or of bettering our world together, but through these kind of different channels or different lenses. And um, so, uh, but I, I have found that it's been, uh, without a doubt, one of the most effective ways to pursue all of this um, in terms of impact and broad out of the interfaith world concept. And I think that demographic is really what's challenging when we get into interfaith, because often you do see the same types of individuals, but when you use culture and the arts, you often broaden that. Thank you. Uh, let me then squeeze in the final question. And um, Bishop Chandler, I appreciate and understand very much the focus, uh, because it, you need a focus, but also the importance of focusing on these quote unquote Abrahamic traditions. I'm wondering though, if uh, because we have a significant Sikh community and Hindu community and Buddhist and Jain and Zoroastrians and others um, that are in the audience and also here in Houston, if you have found that the use of art and particularly this exhibit has also created uh, lines of dialogue outside of the Abrahamic traditions. Yeah, very much so. Because, and this ex exhibit, of course, is largely focused on the Abrahamic or learning from the Abrahamic in a worldview that everyone can benefit from, of course. But uh, yes, most of our exhibits are either intercultural or fully interreligious, uh, not just Abrahamic in that sense. So we work a lot with South Asian artists, for example, that come from uh, in, uh, Hindu uh, traditions, and our Buddhist in Sri Lanka, for example, 
Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it, it's uh, something that works in all faith traditions. In some cultures, such as Hinduism, uh, is are very visual cultures, and so all the more uh, are enhanced in that way. You know, so. Thank you. I think your 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 observation about that not that it's something to be inspired from or learn from, mm -hmm. um, that we need to do the work to see ourselves often in the other or in unfamiliar work is is really uh, I think a very important lesson that I think this exhibit can teach us. So thank you what? very much. Just one comment, Greg, uh, and that is related to some of the theme here, the theme of embracing the other. So when the exhibition is here in Wyoming, for example, the other here would be our Native American sisters and brothers. And so the focus very much is to use these themes that we're learning from Abraham's life toward looking kindly and generously and in an all embracing way to them. Bishop Chandler, thank you so much. Thank you. Jody, before I turn to my closing comments, do you have anything final that you need to mention before we move into uh, closing words and then uh, we'll take a look at the exhibit? No, I think uh, um, we're all excited. We're ready to see this wonderful exhibit. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I do have one thing to say. You're gonna love Greg. He's done an exceptional job in uh, practicing with a few groups before tonight. Um, and he's uh, been very well received and he's done an exceptional job in really guiding groups through this exhibit. So I'm grateful to Greg for doing this tonight for us. Thank you, Jody. I close with our deep appreciation to our friends and tonight's speaker, Bishop Paul Gordon Chandler, to Caravan, to our sponsors, and to all our guests tonight. Our community is stronger because of the strength of shared beliefs. But before I officially conclude our formal program and begin the tour of the exhibit, I want to draw attention to the time in which we are in. It is an impo it's important and helpful to recognize that late March and early April, just the past uh, three weeks, has been an astounding convergence of many major holidays and holy days. We began with the Jewish holiday of Passover, March 27th to April 4th. The Hindu holiday of Holi qu followed quickly after the beginning of Passover on March 29th and was highlighted by a very good uh, article in the Houston Chronicle. Holy Week began with Palm Sunday then on March 28th and concluded with Easter on April 4th with Maundy Thursday, Good Friday and Holy Saturday in between. Helpful to mention though that Christians in the Orthodox churches won't celebrate Easter until May the 2nd. So they're still in the midst of, of their Lent. The important Sikh holiday of Visakhi was April 13th. The Muslim fasting month of Ramadan began Monday night the 12th, and so its first full day was Tuesday the 13th. April 13th with all, also the new year for many Indians and Nepalese, something I didn't know, so you learn something new every day. And the first day of Ridvan, one of the most important holidays in the Baha'i tradition, is today, April the 20th. These holy days, many of them ancient in their practices. Um, sorry. Uh, ancient of their practices remind us that faith is important because these beliefs and practices are both timely and timeless. We are connected across time and space with days past, but these holy days speak to us here and now. Our 15 pieces of art also reflect both a timeless and timely quality as well. And I want to especially draw attention to the time in which we are in, the time right here and right now, the time that we can actually do something with and do something about. Over the past year, we have heard calls for justice, for healing, for forgiveness, for accountability, for peace. And today, the country watched the trial of Derek Chauvin come to a close, or at least a close to this phase, as the jury reached a verdict. I want to recognize the gravity of the times in which we live on a daily basis. Abraham's time was his. Sarah's time and Hagar's time were hers. Their time were theirs. This time is ours. Our sacred scriptures remind us that every day is holy. Along with the days and the months that are set apart, every moment can be holy, each common time and space can be sacred. As we're about to enter this virtual gallery, we are also entering shared space and sacred space. And what art, art teaches us is the practice of seeing, not just seeing with the eyes, but seeing with the heart as well. 
So please, as we enter, drink deeply the themes of this exhibit, of welcoming the stranger, a friend of God, the compassionate, living as a pilgrim, sacrificial love. These are not only Abrahamic themes or themes from texts written hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. These are our themes now. Let us again see in these themes a crucial message of how we can see each other and how we treat each other and especially how we love one another. And now, if you'll give me a moment to switch over, let us go ahead and enter the virtual gallery of Abraham out of one many. And we should be in. Can I get Jody a comment in the chat box that you can see the that you the, that you can see the exhibit? All right. As we enter the gallery, a few reminders. Um, in case of fire or other emergency, there are two exits from the gallery, a gray door in the corner of the exhibit hall and the door that we just came through here. Bathrooms are just outside the main entrance and to your left and lost and found is out and to your right. But levity aside, while the in-person art, and I would love to see it, is wonderful, there are a couple of advantages for the virtual gallery, especially here in COVID. Face masks are not required. Temperature checks not required. Socially distancing is not required. You can eat and drink as you please. You don't need to check your large bags. This exhibit is wheelchair accessible. And interestingly, each piece of art is wonderful, but each piece is about 1.5 feet by 2 feet. But here in the virtual gallery, we'll be able to, uh, to zoom and expand the artwork, and no one gets stuck in the back of the crowd. And finally, as donors and special guests, you will have an exclusive benefit and will receive the link to this exhibit so you can revisit it at your leisure. We won't make the link to the gen uh, available to the general public until the final week of the exhibit, as we're making the exhibit available through a host of events. And so with that, let's again um, come on over and just learn a little bit about our artists. Born in 1977, Sinan Hussein's artistic legacy extends from the heritage of his Mesopotamian ancestors to, the, to its uh, horrifying presence. As uh, Bishop Chandler mentioned, he lives a, he, this is very personal to him. Soon after graduation from the University of Fine Arts in Baghdad in 2004, he had to leave because of the war and the sectarian violence, and he found ref refuge in Kuwait and eventually in the United States. He's participated in many highly acclaimed solo and group exhibitions around the world. And he, again, he is our artist from the Muslim background. In the middle is Kaysal Sindhi, again, also born in Baghdad um, and actually has degrees in fine arts, but he actually has degrees in engineering and experience as an architect. And so again, his, his, his paintings will be the second one, will be the one in the middle. And so um, be mindful of his use of architectural imagery, of, of, of buildings as well. You'll see that his architectural background affects his artistic background as well. And as Bishop Chandler mentioned, cases of an ancient Christian heritage out of, the, again, the Nestorian tradition, the Chaldean Christians, and he lives in San Diego. And again, Shea Asule also has two degrees in fine arts. And he, and you'll see this as well, that his scenes radiate warmth and compassion. His work range between drawing and painting, and they address, again, two conflicting worlds found in the mind of the, of the contemporary painter, the classic and then the modern. And he has also held numerous solo ex exhibitions around the world. And again, he is out of the Orthodox Jewish tradition. So let's go ahead and back out and let's take a look around. And you will see in our virtual uh, gallery that the paintings are in groups of three, according to our three themes. And they are on the perimeter of the gallery. So let's go ahead and walk away uh, this, in this direction. And I'm gonna turn to our left for our first trio. And again, this is the theme, living as a pilgrim. I think one of the things in particular that you'll see as living as a pilgrim and being on the move is that all of them invoke a lot about the imagination. Because as a pilgrim, you're in many ways imagining uh, what your future will be and imagine where, you're, where, where you'll be going. So we'll, back in, we'll, we'll come in a little bit here and we'll take a look at the first, Living as a Pilgrim, Sinan Hussein. And as I lead this one, this, I always enjoy starting with this one because um, 
the question I'll ask is, where is your eye drawn to? And your eye could be drawn in many different places. Naturally, an art eye is often drawn kind of to the, to, to the center. And these, the, the touching gloves tend to really draw the eye in that direction. But the eye is also drawn into the upper left-hand quadrant as well with the very unique imagery of this glass cube around a face. So he says this, this painting, Sanan Hussein says, takes place in the imagination. In this painting, I show Abraham and Sarah thinking about their life and that they're, um, they're interacting, they're talking with one another. And I can, I, can, I can come in a little closer here and you can see that their words are jumbled and they're in Arabic, but they're, they're, they're thinking about one another. He says, and you'll see that he likes to use gloves um, in, in, in other uh, works that you'll see, and that it's that they are intimate as being husband and wife, but they also are not able to touch, which for him is symbolic of they're not able to have a child yet. But that child here in the imagination is, the, is right here in, uh, in, in, Sarah's, uh, in Sarah's arm. It's a soul. It has not been born yet, so it's the potential. And here on, on the top of, of Ibrahim's head is the Kaaba, the cube that sits at the center of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, really the, the um, pilgrimage site within Islam. Oh, there's a lot more that we could say, uh, but we, we, we don't have a lot of time um, with just given a half an hour, and I want to make sure that we take a look at all of them. Moving over, we'll take a look, oops, sorry, slide over. And we'll take a look in here. Case Al Sindi, living as a pilgrim. And again, you can see the buildings in the background that are kind of belie his, uh, his architectural background. And this really tells the story of Abraham. And he says, Abraham left his pilgr pilgrimage from Ur of the Chaldees. Again, very personal for Al Sindi as he's of Chaldean Christian heritage. This is where the great ziggurat of Ur, southern Iraq, built by Urnamu, the Sumerian king. I painted Abraham carrying a sheep around his shoulders, and we can move in just a little bit more and see that detail around his shoulders as a shepherd leading his people to the land that God promised him. I also depict the ziggurat, the, the building behind him, on his shoulders because he carries his land with him in his heart as he journeys. And that is actually a really important theme, not only I think to the artist, but also to us at Interfaith Ministries as one of our major service areas is refugee services. And we work with refugees from all around the world who I think would very much affiliate and empathize with that, that idea of, of carrying your home from which you came to the different places that you go. And our, our, our refugees before coming to the United States have been resettled, if not at least one, if at least one, if not two places. So they have many homes that they carry with them. And again, take a look, you, you'll see actually all of these artists use this similar um, uh, um, kind of color palette along the way. Bishop Chandler mentioned this one as well. This is um, Shea Azule's Living as a Pilgrim. So much seems to be like a mirage where there is promise, but the vision is foggy. The only way forward is to simply believe a concept that, can, uh, that cannot exist only in the mind, but beyond it. So you can imagine that this pilgrim, as he or she is working across the desert, um, is, is, has to use his or her imagination to think about what is ahead when the person is so small, but the space is so large. Three themes of living as a pilgrim. Let's go ahead and back out a little bit and we will turn around to take a look at our next trio with the theme welcoming the stranger. And as you can see, you can see a similar color palette, especially with between Hussein's um, painting of, of um, oops, of life as a, of living as a pilgrim. And here is welcoming the stranger and we'll zoom on in and take a look. Again, as Bishop Chandler mentioned that Hussein, his, his, the, the life of the imagination, the life of what could be, uh, and the life of what is all kind of merged through here. And he says, again, blending the contemporary with the historical and a lot of symbolism here that, that Hussein uses. In this painting, Abraham and Sarah are welcoming Ishmael into their lives. 
and Ishmael in Islam is viewed uh, is uh, is is outside of Islam. Um, Ishmael is viewed often as very secondary, but is very primary within Islam. And God is sending a blessing down on Ishmael's head, and you can see uh, behind him the, that uh, that beam of light that's coming down. The figures are celebrating, and they represent souls, angels, and souls, and they can ch- they can take all kind of any shape that they want. And you can see one that kind of looks like a half-formed person and a dog or some sort of animal with wings. Hussein likes to use cones as a symbol of a time set apart, similar to um, how you would use cones to set apart a, a traffic area or a construction area. But he uses the cone as this is a time that is set apart. And again, you can see the green, the, the green glove to portray an extremely positive moment. And green is an important color in Islam. Moving over, we'll take a look here. Again, welcoming the stranger. As human beings, we're all visitors in others' lives, Al Cindy says. We visit and disappear. And so he has depicted three people, but none of them are Abraham. Imagine in many ways that you are Abraham welcoming these three these three people, these three travelers, these three pilgrims. One of these visitors told, um, and then um, you can see that there are three small cups that represent equal amounts of, of hospitality or generosity. But especially notice in the distance, we'll get up there a little closer, that these three may be on their journey the next day, but there's always another person that's coming from the distance that we can welcome. And welcoming the stranger again is very important within our, within our work at Interfaith, at Interfaith Ministries. And then finally, with welcoming the stranger, we'll take a look at Shea Azules. He's actually got three events going on. Wanted to create a dynamic sense of the encounter of Abraham's historic welcome and three strangers in the desert. And so Azule does, I think, a wonderful job, whether it's here in the foreground of perhaps it's explaining or teaching something, or here in the, in the midground, a person that is showing these strangers this new land. And again, these flights of fancy or imagination that we see. And again, we, we find some similarities in the way that, uh, that Azule likes to construct his people that you'll find um, a, co- a commonality as we co- continue through. Now, going to the third theme of sacrificial love, a key story within Islam and Christianity, within Christianity, within Genesis and Islam within the Quran is the story of a sacrifice or a near sacrifice. Within Judaism and Christianity, it's called the Akedah, which means the binding, the binding of Isaac. And in the case of Islam, with the centrality of Ishmael, it's the near sacrifice of Ishmael. And while we don't have to talk about sacrificing people in this harrowing story, we, uh, what we can talk about is the love that Ibrahim or Abraham or Avraham has for God and also that, uh, that, that he has for his child as well, as well as Sarah and Hagar's love for their children as well, that is made so explicit and clear within the sacred texts. So again, taking a look here, starting with Hussein's, again, our theme here is sacrificial love. Notes that Abraham des- demonstrated sacrificial love throughout his lifetime, through, uh, from his willingness to, make, to be ready to make an ultimate sacrifice of God, uh, to God, to allowing others the best choice of land. It is impossible to love deeply without sacrifice. Again, the richness of the colors and the use of, again, of these imaginative flights of fancy that I think really engage the viewer in so many ways. There's so much more that we can say, and we'll actually be focusing on the, this, uh, this work of art in one of, our, uh, in one of our dinner dialogues as well. Again, Alcindi from the Chaldean Christian heritage. One of the main stories in the life of Abraham is the sacrifice of Isaac. As I meditated on the story, Alcindi says, I find it difficult to capture Abraham's expression. And so that's why I don't reveal his eyes in the painting. I think you can just see, you can see just at the very top through the beard or through a covering that you can see um, a little detail of his face. Thus, the sh- and the short palm tree here on the left and it symbolizes that everything is small compared to sacrificial love demonstrated by Abraham in this great act of selflessness. 
Again, we can back in, we can move in just a little bit and you can see again, some of the richness. I, I, I think it's really important to see that if you could be up close with the, the paintings live, that there's also a three dimensional quality to them. You can see in this one in particular, some of the raised um, contours of the use of, of, paint, of, of the paint. So paintings are really important to see that they're just not two dimensional, but three dimensional as well. It's also helpful to see, and I'll point that out in one of them, that Alcindy actually incorporates pieces of felt, pieces of fabric into his, uh, into his art as well. Now really taking a different approach is Shea Azule. This is sacrificial love as well. Azule says this, I show the patriarch Abraham on a flying carpet, observing a large circle dance. Circle dancing is a very much a part of Jewish culture. For me, the circle represents something that connects people from all backgrounds and break down, breaks down walls. In the circle, we become one. So moving in here, I always like to, I like to ask, where is your eye drawn to? That's really in many ways, one of the first questions that you should ask yourself when looking at a piece of art. Uh, is where is your eye drawn to? Um, uh, many people say to the green, um, I'm always drawn to this upper left-hand quadrant because of the how this hair, and again, you'll have to forgive me, I'm slightly colorblind, I think it's green or yellow, um, Holly, will, my wife will have to help me out here, but especially upon the, the contrast of the dark blue field, that one sticks out to me. Um, I think the circle is also a wonderful symbol of sacrificial love. Because what is it about a circle that's important? Nobody's first, nobody's last. And I always imagine here um, that the, this trio of people here kind of at the top kind of have their act together. They're act, acting in unison. They've got, their, they've got their legs all choreographed and synchronized versus down here in the lower right-hand corner, it's sort of a mess, which is in many ways the definition of community as well. I think for me, when I take a look at uh, Azule's use of the circle as sacrificial love. I think the message is, if we all give just a little bit of what we have to one another, we can be like the people in the circle. No one has more, no one has less, no one is first, no one is last, but everyone is equal and everyone's got to work together for this circle to work. Sacrificial love. Let's go ahead and take a look at our next to last trio. And I'm just gonna turn here and we'll take a look here. These three are about the compassionate and Abraham exemplifies compassion for others regardless of who they are. And many of these are the, uh, the, the artists in this trio focus particularly on the lack of hospitality that Abraham was shown at Sodom and Gomorrah. And here, Sanan Hussein, he, Hussein paints the, the and what's, what's wonderful about art is while once it's done and it's, it's on the canvas and it's hung on the wall, it's static. There's nothing else added, but it's really helpful to remember that art is very dynamic. And so you can feel the movement right to left of, of, this, of this piece of art. And Hussein says that um, Abraham is fleeing the inhospitality, the evil, the grotesqueness, the distortion of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. But instead of going and cursing them, what is he doing as he's turning to the left? He's pleading to God to have compassion on them. And God is sending a message to Abraham through a yellow bird-like form. As in Islam, birds are sometimes used to send messages. The yellow of Abraham's boots are representative of his divine protection from the evil. And after God accepts Abraham's compassionate plea for them, he will ask Abraham to take off his boots. And again, you can see uh, the cone that is indicative of that this is a sacred moment set apart from us. This is in many cases people's favorites. This is also the compassionate. Abraham pleaded again with God to spare the city. In this painting, Abraham's long arms are a sign of compassion. They're almost inhumanly long, but long enough to encompass the three children. And the artist uses, the, again, the three children of the Abrahamic traditions. But we can imagine them being children of all faiths, of all cultures as well. I think, again, 
uh, this is also an excellent piece of art uh, to, to, um, to highlight and to, to highlight the importance of taking a look at art from a distance before walking in closer, because from here you can really see that this piece of art also looks like a mountain. And so that strength of the mountain of compassion is also indicative and is also exemplified here. And finally, Shea Azule, I, I portray Abraham who is a seer with a thought bubble. And so this is Abraham remembering something that happened to him. Remembering Zakor is very important within the Jewish tradition of remembering our ancestors, of remembering what happened. And that's in particularly it was, was, was all about uh, what Passover is about, which was celebrated just a few weeks ago. And it's also important to remember that Abraham is not remember, he's, he's remembering the bad times and he's remembering having to flee, but he's not remembering, if you take a look at the, 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 the visage the, 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 on his face, is he's, I think, for me, that says he's remembering with compassion. I don't see anger on his face, but he's remembering even in the midst of trying to remember a difficult time when he had to flee in hospitality, that he does not need to be inhospitable himself in his memory. Three paintings that exemplify the compassionate. Finally, I'm going to walk out a little bit and I'm going to turn around. A friend of God. And again, I, 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 I agree with Bishop Chandler 100% that how do you know if you're a friend of God is when that you're a friend of others. And Hussein has here with a friend of God, just this, again, wonderful kind of very busy and active, um, imaginative piece. He says, this is a celebration of life. People, creatures, vegetations, and animals come together for a festival. God has sent a pink horse because Abraham embraces all that God has created. People throughout the whole world never stop praising. The earth is alive. Even a cat's face has taken on a dog's face as well to symbolize that sort of transformation that can happen, particularly be, you know, between two animals that are considered traditionally as enemies. Everything is swimming around Abraham as he blesses the sacred earth. Moving next to Alcindy, a friend of God. And this is very, very timely as well. Um, Alcindy says this, one of the critical issues in our world today is the struggle to exist in a global economy. In this painting, I depict Abraham at the center of a circular table. Let me get in a little bit closer here. There we go. You can see kind of, I love, uh, again, how, how Alcindy provides enough detail in faces so that you can see that they're human, but not so much that you can readily identify them as a person of this heritage or a person of that background. They're all of us. But here in the center, we see Abraham. This friendship leads them to share the one apple that they're about to be given. I strongly believe, he says, that with positive dialogue and well-intentioned conversation, the iceberg that represents our differences will be melted away. And then finally, and this is the one that we have used at Interfaith Ministries as a, uh, in, in, in a lot of our collateral in, in um, sharing and advertising the exhibit, A Friend of God for, by Shea Azule. And so if you have your chat box open, we've got a little time for this, actually. Um, answer this question for me. Are these people falling into the hands or are they being lifted out of the hands? Are they coming in? Are they going into the hands or are they going out of the hands? And again, it's the beauty of art as well. Again, I, I, I will echo Bishop Chandler's words that for the way that that art is so important is because it is transcendent. It is imaginative and we need more imagination. There's an old saying that um, war is a failure of imagination. And I think a lot of our conflicts are a failure of imagination, that we think that old, that, that old conflicts can be solved with old ways. And all, of our, all, the, all faiths give the opportunity, have within them the seeds of imagination, of creativity, to think of new ways of solving these often seemingly intractable problems. 
Art is invitational. Everybody is welcome to this piece of art with their, with, with their interpretations and what they see. Art, again, is subversive. Again, you can talk about important things through art and you don't even know you're talking about them. And finally, art is, transcends boundaries as well, that they, they are able to move in and out of spaces in ways that a lot of other conversations cannot. My painting, Azule says, is a metaphor of a famous blessing that says, when you open your hands to all, everything you need comes to you. Above Abraham's hands, I have painted floating figures like angels symbolizing God's blessings on those who are generous toward all. And so, yeah, they, I, 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 I think it's a both and falling into the hands as a friend would capture and protect and support but it's also these souls, these really us being released into the world um, to be hopeful, to be free, to use again our imagination and creativity, much like these artists have in order to inspire and to transform. And so we have here a friend of God, the compassionate, over around that corner, um, sacrificial love on the far wall, um, welcoming the stranger, and on that very first wall, living as a pilgrim. I hope you've enjoyed being uh, with us on this, uh, on this virtual tour. We will work on sending this link out to all of you so you can enjoy them, one of the kind of special benefits of this opening event. But we have a host of events coming up as well with, uh, in, um, um, over the next month as well, culminating with the Gershenson lecture on May the 20th. Uh, and with that, um, I can't remember if we have, no, I think we are done at 7 p.m. and it's 6.58. Um, Jody, do you have any closing words? And I'll also recognize Bishop Chandler if he's got any closing words as well. Jody? I do not. I will always yield the floor to Bishop Chandler. Hi there, Jody, thank you. Uh, Am I on mute or can you hear me? You can hear me. We can hear, okay. you. Uh, well done, Greg. I think I'm gonna, we're gonna hire you to tour the, the rest of the, the, uh, the exhibit wherever it goes. Uh, you can't have it more than 10% of his time, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I learned a lot too, Greg, so that was wonderful. Uh, two things just about the art. One is, um, Greg briefly mentioned there was some material on Kesel Cindy's work. And it's actually, uh, they're cut pieces from a cloak of a shepherd in Ur, where Abraham, of course, originated from and where Pope Francis was not so long ago, focusing on interfaith. And I don't know if, Greg, you highlighted that or not. I couldn't remember hearing that. but I did mention one of the, but I will make sure and highlight that because it is one of the neat portions. Yeah, that, it's a that unique. The, that, um, that fabric is there with the, uh, with the other medium. And until uh, probably still, it smells of sheep. So you'll have individuals who are attending the exhibition, you'll, and you pictures are taken of them with their nose, you know, up smelling the, the cloak. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is all the art is for sale. Uh, there are a few pieces that have actually sold, and 100% of the proceeds goes to uh, interfaith peace building. So not to the artist. Thank you. It's been a privilege to be with you. Thank you, Bishop Chandler. Thank you again for being, uh, for, for really making this a wonderful opening, a great kickoff for the next month of, I think, a variety of wonderful events. Um, with that, uh, Jody, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and say, to, and ask everyone to have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you hopefully at the next event. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Bishop Chandler. Thank you.